I've entitled the talk, uh, Management of High Blood Pressure, uh, best, practices, best Practices in Measurement, uh, Treatment Goals, Diet, and Medications. And, the, and those uh, elements will serve as the outline uh, of the presentation tonight. Um, as we ask all of our speakers uh, to, to disclose, we have uh, no, I have no relevant financial relationships with any of the material that I'll be discussing tonight. When we talk about high blood pressure, we do so in the context of heart disease and stroke, uh, or if we group it together, uh, what we group together calling it cardiovascular disease. Um, and over the course of the last uh, several decades, the risk of cardiovascular disease in the United States has fell uh, quite dramatically uh, for, by 50% uh, uh, in the 20 years before 2000 and by another third or so in the year since 2000. So whatever it is we're doing, it's working. Uh, the rates uh, of the, uh, the, the final disease outcomes that we care about by treating high blood pressure uh, is working. We're preventing more heart disease, preventing more uh, strokes. Uh, in addition, we prevent heart failure, uh, kidney disease, and a variety of other uh, problems related to high blood pressure. When we try to analyze why this is going down, what's working, uh, what we find is about half of it comes from improvements in what happens in the hospital. So the early care uh, from the ambulance through the emergency department, uh, in some cases into the catheterization laboratory or the uh, coronary care unit or the stroke intensive care unit, uh, those new treatments which have been developed over the last several decades are extremely effective uh, and have contributed in a very important way to the reduction in uh, mortality or death uh, from uh, these, these, these diseases. Interestingly, about an equal amount, another half comes from what we call reduction of uh, the risk factors, uh, which predispose to heart disease and stroke. And the three main ones that have worked are blood pressure reduction, cholesterol reduction, which we'll talk about later in the course, uh, and smoking cessation. Uh, we'll also say a few words about smoking cessation uh, soon in next week as we talk about the prevention of lung cancer. So these very common uh, conditions uh, really have a major impact and it's why there's so much science related to them uh, and why, why we're so diligent uh, in treating high blood pressure, high blood cholesterol and smoking uh, in the clinical office. The goals uh, for tonight are really to review what's new and interesting and controversial uh, in related to high blood pressure. Uh, and, the, and my actual personal goal is to make sure that in, for each of us, when we see our clinicians and have discussions about uh, whether to start uh, dietary changes, lifestyle changes, or medications uh, to lower our blood pressure, that we do it in a way that's well-informed and so that we can uh, participate in a process that I'll call shared decision-making, uh, where you and your clinician uh, really sort through the challenge, the benefits and harms of these conditions uh, in a manner that meets your own needs and your own personal values, uh, desires, goals, uh, and concerns about uh, risk and prevention. And this is one way to think about this. Uh, this uh, seesaw is relevant for uh, almost all the talks uh, in this course. And in, in some respects, as a primary care clinician, which is what I uh, am clinically, um, the, the balancing between benefits and harms or risk reduction and harm uh, is something that is at the centerpiece of everything we do in clinical medicine. And I, I feel as my job as, the, as a clinician um, is to really help patients understand both the benefits and the harms of a given intervention, again, so that the patient uh, can be well-informed uh, and participate and guide uh, the clinical decisions that are needed uh, to make uh, decisions about a given uh, uh, next step uh, or treatment. In addition, we spend a lot of time about talking about risk reduction. I'll say much more about this when we talk about high blood cholesterol. Uh, but suffice it to say that often in medicine, 
we hear a lot typically in the newspaper uh, or the news or uh, on social media about a, a treatment which has led to a risk reduction. Um, that is to say something new has happened and it lowers your risk of something by 20%. And that's what gets the headline is that 20% number or 40% number or 80% number. But from a patient's point of view, what also matters is 20% of what? And that is to say, if your risk of something happening is very, very small, and you lower that by 20% or even 50%, you haven't gained much benefit statistically. On the other hand, if your risk of having something occur to you is very high, and you can lower that by 20% or 40% or 60%, now we're talking. And so that balance between the effectiveness of a given treatment and that what we call the native risk of the patient uh, is what guides our decision-making uh, in much of the cardiovascular uh, risk reduction of several of the topics we'll discuss over the course. So both the relative risk and what we call, and the native risk combined make what we may call the absolute risk. And I'll say more about that uh, throughout the course. But the key principle here is that you as a consumer of healthcare, as, as a patient, uh, really want to be as informed as possible, not just of the benefits of what uh, is being offered, but also what are the potential harms? And what is the likeliness, the likelihood that you uh, statistically will benefit rather than uh, the population at large? All right, so we don't have a formal polling system uh, that we're gonna use tonight, but I do want you to at least think uh, to yourself uh, to this question, because it's gonna underlie um, uh, much of the conversation we have, especially about the central issue of what threshold do we use to treat high blood pressure? This turns out to be much more complicated than you would think. If we, chart the relationship between your systolic blood pressure, that is your the upper number, uh, against your risk of stroke, heart attack, and mortality, we can find abnormalities statistically in the population at large at blood pressure levels as low as 118 or close to 120. But the increase is very gradual through as we go through uh, that 120 and 130 and 140. And then the curve begins to uh, become sharper up and the risk becomes greater. So there's been a lot of debate in the medical community and community, the medical literature, uh, and I'll spend some time discussing that tonight, as to what number we should use in order to lower, to begin treatment formally, with, especially with medications, for someone's blood pressure. And uh, I'll conclude with uh, uh, some options. Uh, so I will answer this question uh, throughout the night, but I want you to think about it. So let's use as a case, a 60 year old uh, person. Uh, and in the office, uh, the blood pressure um, taken carefully, and I'll explain what I mean by that uh, uh, soon, uh, is 145 over 85. And let me just say uh, one other thing quickly, which is we talk about the upper number, which is the systolic, blood pressure. The lower number on the other side of the uh, dash is the diastolic blood pressure. It turns out both are important, but the uh, higher number, the systolic blood pressure, turns out to be more predictive of uh, strokes and heart attack than the lower number. We will also treat an elevated lower number, but most of our attention focuses on the upper number especially as you get older, the measurement of the lower number uh, becomes a little less reliable. So it's the systolic blood pressure that drives a lot of our thinking. And that would be true in this case as well. So her, the, the patient, I'm sorry, the patient had a blood pressure of 145 over 85, and the patient's in uh, good health uh, without any uh, evidence of diabetes, any prior heart disease or stroke. Uh, the kidney function is uh, normal. Um, and they're otherwise well. 
Uh, we'll talk about uh, some of their lifestyle uh, behaviors uh, in a moment. Uh, but let's talk first about as you're, as a patient uh, going into this conversation, or if you're a clinician uh, and taking the clinician side with the patient, uh, what would your treatment uh, goal be? What would be a, the, the point at which you would begin a treatment? Would it be 100 less, uh, 150 millimeters of mercury? That's how the, the, the unit we use to measure blood pressure. 140 millimeters of mercury or 130. So just think about that for a minute and we'll go through uh, some definitions and uh, what different uh, types of uh, evidence there is for each of these and uh, what type of, uh, uh, and how the medical community has actually uh, had diverse opinions on uh, this, this, what you would think would be a relatively simple question, but it turns out it's not. Now, I wanna spend a, a moderate amount of time on uh, measuring blood pressure. And the reason for this is because if we measure blood pressure incorrectly, and especially incorrectly in the too high category, then we will end up treating many, many people who simply don't need treatment of their uh, blood pressure. The, um, so this is most important. The, the major uh, error is in uh, uh, overestimating uh, blood pressure. Now, there are three basic ways to do this, um, and you've probably encountered these. Uh, the most uh, common is uh, office measurement uh, in the uh, clinician's office. Uh, and for most of our uh, scientific uh, lives, uh, these are the measurements that have been used in the scientific research trials or the clinical trials that have demonstrated that treatment of high blood pressure with medications prevents heart disease and stroke. So that's a good uh, baseline to, uh, to appreciate. Increasingly, especially over the last decade or so, uh, there's been much more attention to home blood pressure measurement. Uh, and there are many ways to do this, and we'll discuss that as well. Uh, and it turns out that the, uh, the, the blood pressure measurement at home uh, is a little bit lower. So our normal values at home should be at least five or 10 points lower than it is in the office. The third uh, way to do it, and this is one you may not have uh, heard about before or, or used, is what we call an ambulatory blood pressure monitor. Uh, and this is uh, where you wear a device um, around the upper arm usually uh, that uh, inflates itself like a blood pressure cuff. Uh, and uh, um, measures your blood pressure periodically throughout the day. And this gives you a 24-hour average of your blood pressure. Uh, and in some recent studies, although we've traditionally considered the office blood pressure as the best correlate with um, stroke and heart disease, it turns out that the ambulatory monitors actually add additional value. And so we have three uh, unique uh, methods for uh, measuring blood pressure. And it turns out that uh, they're different uh, and they may come out with uh, different, uh, different results. Uh, and it's necessary sometimes to uh, balance one against another uh, and maybe even break the tie uh, with something with a third test like an ambulatory monitor. Now, one of the very first things that, um, that we teach our health professional students uh, in, in healthcare training is how to take the blood pressure. It turns out though, that despite this being one of the very first skills that people learn, is that when you analyze what people do in the real world, that this is very, very commonly done incorrectly. And unfortunately, in each instance, if you do this incorrectly, the results come out too high. So it's very hard to get blood pressure results that are artificially too low. They're almost always artificially too high if they are incorrect. Now, what does it mean to be correct? What do we use as the gold standard? As I implied, sometimes we need different methods uh, 
to get a more complete picture. That is the office value, a home value, uh, and maybe a third test. Uh, but nonetheless, wherever we're measuring the blood pressure, we want to use these uh, best principles. And there are, uh, you can break this down into about 19 different factors um, that constitute a well taken blood pressure. Uh, I've summarized them uh, to seven or eight. Uh, but one of the most important ones is that the patient, that you, uh, the person, uh, should be seated in a chair uh, for about five minutes before the blood pressure is taken. Typically, this is with your feet on the ground and your back supported. Very importantly, uh, you should not have had caffeine, uh, uh, coffee drinks or other caffeine drinks uh, in the periods half an hour, hour uh, prior to taking uh, your blood pressure. Uh, if you, uh, you should not have just come off exercise, uh, you have not, should not have just rushed to the doctor's office uh, and you should not have had a cigarette for at least 30 minutes or longer. Also very important for a correct blood pressure to be taken, there should be no talking by the patient or the observer. Talking by the patient when a blood pressure is being measured elevates the blood pressure measurement. And so it would be incorrect to take part of a medical history or an, a chief complaint, for example, uh, at the same time as one is uh, taking the blood pressure. Blood pressure should to be taken most accurately should be taken without any clothing under the blood pressure cuff. This is another very common mistake uh, when you see blood pressure taken in medical offices um, uh, that uh, the cuff is put on over uh, a shirt sleeve or a sweater sleeve and that will also uh, falsely elevate uh, the blood pressure measurement. The arm should be uh, supported uh, either on a table uh, or by the uh, clinician's arm so that it's horizontally at the level of the center of the heart. And then finally, uh, one it's really important that one uses a blood pressure cuff that is the appropriate size. Blood pressure cuffs now are marked uh, to um, uh, designate uh, how much of an arm uh, can fit in a given blood pressure cuff. Uh, but it's very common uh, if you purchase uh, a blood pressure cuff without, uh, without thinking about the size, about half of us or more may end up with a cuff that's too small. And once again, here too, a cuff that is too small or too tight um, may incorrectly elevate the blood pressure. Because of muscles uh, or fat, it doesn't matter what makes your arm uh, larger, uh, but for, again, about half of, of, of individuals, you need an adult large size cuff rather than an adult regular. The, um, uh, so the correct cuff size is one of the most common errors uh, that's made uh, in, in blood pressure measurement. So you can see this is a lot to think about. Uh, this is what we teach in our offices, uh, although uh, often it's not done exactly correctly, even in our own medical offices. If you are taking the blood pressure at home for yourself, you want to use the same exact principles. Um, and uh, I'll give some additional tips on taking blood pressure at home in a minute. Uh, but each of these general principles are the same in the office as they would be at home. And you can also take more than one measurement uh, and, um, and either record an average of two measurements or three and write that down as your, uh, the measurement of record or you can take, uh, keep a record of the last uh, blood pressure measurement. This turns out to be a bit of a controversy in the, in the literature. Uh, and many guidelines uh, recommend uh, averaging multiple measurements. And at home, uh, that's an easy thing to do. In the office though, when people are rushing into the office, um, uh, and as I mentioned, may have a, a clothing on uh, or maybe talking, the first blood pressure may be 
uh, artificially elevated. And so even averaging with that may not be accurate. Um, so uh, one of the newer uh, approaches to this uh, is to uh, count the last measurement. If you do two or three, count the last one and put that in the medical record. So either of these is correct, uh, but again, uh, for home purposes, either of these is correct. Uh, in, the, in the office, I often, especially if there's a difference between the first one uh, and the second one, I will record the second blood pressure. Now, I've, I've talked about three ways to do this. It's actually sort of a fourth. Um, uh, and this mostly came from a very uh, big study, which we'll spend some time on uh, uh, throughout the evening. It's called the SPRINT trial, which was the systolic blood pressure intervention trial. And the SPRINT trial drives some of the recommendations and some of the controversy about blood pressure uh, treatment thresholds. And what they did in this study uh, was that they basically used a, a mechanical measurement tool, almost a robotic measurement tool. And again, very carefully put the patients, the subjects in a dark room, uh, there was no human interaction. Uh, they rested for a period of time, five minutes or more. Uh, and uh, there were automated measurements uh, and the numbers were averaged. So this was following the guidelines of the prior slide, uh, but to the max. Um, and interestingly, when they compared their blood pressure in this taken in this what we call research grade measurement or really careful measurement, it was over 12 points lower than what happened when the initial blood pressure was taken by a clinician uh, at, at the entry into the office uh, for that visit. So these uh, these experiment this study used doctors uh, all clinicians' offices. Uh, a blood pressure was taken by a medical assistant or an LVN. Uh, the way it is in, uh, in our offices. But when the research grade value was measured, this really carefully done uh, value, it was over 12 points lower. And so I'll come back to that point uh, because the SPRINT trial makes recommendations that are lower than many of our other sources of evidence. And it's worth noting that they used a particularly careful way of measuring the blood pressure and one uh, might argue that one would want to reproduce that kind of measurement if one was going to use uh, their thresholds. But I'll come back to that. Now, I said I would return to home blood pressure measurement. Turns out the science behind this is not as extensive as you would think. Um, it's, uh, but increasingly, um, many clinicians uh, in the United States and certainly in, uh, in other parts of the world uh, will demand uh, home blood pressures uh, in combination with office blood pressures before one uh, officially diagnoses uh, and certainly before one begins uh, uh, medications uh, for high blood pressure. Does measuring at home really make it better? Uh, well, there's not great evidence one way or another. Uh, there aren't that many studies that just do home, home measurement with or without and compare the two. But there are many studies that have a more comprehensive approach to blood pressure measurement, uh, of which home monitoring is part of the care. And in those studies, uh, which also have other factors like other health professionals, um, uh, helping manage the medications and teaching and diet and so on, uh, there is a benefit uh, to this home measurement. As I mentioned, uh, if you're doing uh, blood pressure measurement at home, you wanna use the same principles that we just discussed. Um, the same principles uh, of office measurement of sitting for five minutes, not drinking any coffee, uh, having your arm bared, uh, not talking, uh, not smoking, and so on, and having uh, the correct equipment. When should you take the blood pressure? Um, th this is interesting and not totally well established. Um, however, uh, my own practice uh, is what I'll describe, 
uh, which is that we know, and some of the guidelines uh, are based on, uh, agree with this, which is where my opinion is derived, uh, is that because the blood pressure varies over the course of the day in a, a somewhat diurnal rhythm, so that the morning blood pressure may be higher than the late afternoon blood pressure, it's important to take both. Uh, so therefore, what we uh, often recommend is not to check your blood pressure every day, uh, but if you're uh, in the process of assessing uh, whether you need medication, you might check it more often, uh, or if you're checking, uh, if you're monitoring it for uh, effectiveness of the treatment, I would pick one or two days a week on a day that you can check it twice uh, and check it in the morning. Uh, and the morning value should be before you've taken your medications and before you've had coffee. So you wake up, uh, wash up, um, don't have coffee, sit, relax uh, for several minutes, up to five, and then with a bare, uh, uh, a bare arm, take your first blood pressure. Then go about your day. Uh, and before dinner, again, without coffee, without cigarettes, without wine, and so on, take a second value before dinner. And those two uh, then uh, form a nice framing of your blood pressure. Uh, and different people have different patterns of which one is higher. Not everyone's is the same, uh, but it gives you uh, a way to, to frame uh, the highest and the lowest over the course of a day. And again, uh, one keeps a record of these and averaging over time uh, is the most effective way uh, to do that. Now, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, um, abbreviated ABPM, is a test ordered by clinicians. Uh, it's usually in the same place you might get an electrocardiogram or an echocardiogram. Um, and as I implied, this is the most sophisticated approach to an out-of-office out of measurement of your uh, blood pressure. Uh, and the machine on its own uh, uh, checks the blood pressure several times uh, per hour. And it's uh, as opposed to the resting blood pressure that we just described carefully, this is a little different approach because it includes resting and it can also be programmed to be taken during sleep. Uh, and it also includes uh, measurements during uh, your daily activities. Um, so it's overall, it's lower than the office visit uh, than an office blood pressure, but the exact relationship is not the same in each patient. In other words, this is not always five points lower, 10 points lower, uh, but it's typically a bit lower. And we use a somewhat, we take that into consideration uh, in deciding uh, whether to treat a patient. And as I mentioned, uh, this technique, uh, which should not be used in every patient or even maybe most patients, but it's an excellent tiebreaker. And, and uh, when you need, when you're just confused because the office visits are showing one thing and the home visits are showing a different thing, or the morning is showing one thing and the evening is showing a different thing, uh, this may give you a third data point uh, to help uh, sort out uh, where we're going and what our next best step is. So uh, let me conclude this section of the talk. I've spent a lot of time on this, but in, I really feel that this is in some ways, the most important thing we can do, uh, which is uh, it's hard to treat something effectively if you don't measure it effectively. Um, and, and many of the other things we're gonna talk about in this course uh, are much more precise, with, whether it's your blood sugar or your blood cholesterol. Um, uh, but uh, this is one that requires a, a human factor, unless you're using the robotic measures. Uh, that, uh, that require uh, some thought and some best, and some best practices. So uh, wherever you are, I'll make sure that best practices are being used. Um, I would argue that because best practices are not done everywhere, uh, that some of those blood pressures should have less importance. So for example, if you go to the dentist's office and the blood pressure is high, um, that's somewhat predictable if it's higher at the dentist's office, or if you go into the emergency department with a, a pain, a, a, an orthopedic problem or an ab abdominal pain, your blood pressure is highly likely to be higher and so on. Or if you're in uh, seeing a clinician who doesn't care as much about your blood pressure, uh, they may not uh, use the same best practices. 
So uh, places that care most, and like your primary care office, a cardiologist office, your uh, kidney doctor office, uh, uh, your uh, uh, neuro doctor offices, uh, those are the places typically where people will, will use the best practices. And those are the measurements uh, that uh, may be uh, the most important. As I said, we use repeat measurements. We typically uh, average uh, if at home in the office, though it's okay to record uh, the, uh, the last value. Uh, we recommend home blood pressure measurements for uh, most patients, um, especially before starting medications. Uh, and if there's a difficulty with control uh, as measured in the office. Uh, and uh, we don't use ambulatory monitoring as much, maybe not as much as we should. Uh, I, I'm not advocating that every patient needs it by any means. I think home measurements uh, uh, serve the same function for most patients, uh, but ambulatory monitoring is very effective. It correlates well with the things we care most about, um, and it serves as a good tiebreaker uh, when uh, there's uncertainty as to what to do next. Let's talk next about uh, both uh, treatment of high blood pressure without medications, and in some respects, this also serves as an opportunity to discuss prevention of blood pressure because the things that work to treat blood pressure in people who have high blood pressure also are the same measures that work to prevent high blood pressure in people with normal blood pressures. So just again, to get you thinking a little bit about this, um, we'll start with uh, uh, the same patient so there's a 60 year old person, the blood pressure in the office was 145 over 85, carefully measured. And, and, uh, and you're going to think about uh, uh, non-drug uh, treatments of your uh, blood pressure. Uh, and so when we think about uh, non-drug lifestyle modifications, which of these would you say is the most effective uh, method uh, of lowering an elevated blood pressure or a borderline blood pressure. So the options are weight loss if you're overweight uh, or meet the criteria for uh, what we call obesity, uh, alcohol restriction, especially in people who drink more than three or four drinks per day. You don't have to become a teetotaler for this to work, uh, but uh, lowering uh, blood pressure, uh, lowering alcohol use, uh, to one or so drinks per day has been shown to be effective. Uh, use of uh, limitations of salt in the diet or sodium restriction. The DASH diet, DASH stands for Dietary Alternatives to Stop Hypertension. This was the study of uh, the diet used in a famous series of studies by the federal government. Um, and it's basically a heart healthy diet that we'll talk about as the course develops. Uh, but uh, that's also an effective way to lower your uh, blood pressure. Uh, and physical activity, that is a regular exercise. So which of these uh, would be the most effective if you could just snap your fingers uh, and make, make it happen? Well, it turns out that they are all effective. Uh, and the most effective, though, is weight loss in patients who are overweight or obese. Now, uh, this is not necessarily the easiest one on this list to do, but if you can get people to lose weight or if you're, you yourself can lose weight, this is an extremely effective way to lower blood pressure. And I'll show you the quantity in the next slide. But it turns out all five of these are effective ways to, to lower your blood pressure without medications. And they all work in combination with medications. So you can start this way before you take medication uh, and spend some time deciding whether you're gonna uh, start a medication or not and give it a good shot, thinking that these are tools in your toolbox, if you will, uh, as ways to lower your blood pressure uh, without medications. And you may be, if you're successful at losing some weight or, or the other things listed here, uh, you may not need medication. Similarly, if you're already on medication uh, and you do any of these things uh, effectively, uh, you may be able to decrease the dose of a medication, or you may be able to prevent the need to start a second or third medication. 
So these are very effective at any phase of the of uh, of, of blood pressure, uh, and as I implied, these same uh, uh, methods are also applicable to the community at large. Uh, so if the, we as a population lost a little bit of weight or drank less or had less sodium in our uh, food supply or ate a more heart healthy, lower fat, more natural food uh, diet uh, and exercise more, then our entire population's blood pressure would go down and that would prevent a very large number of heart attacks and strokes. So this works both on the personal level for each of us and also on the population level uh, for all of us as a community. And here are some of this, uh, the science behind uh, that slide. Um, so the weight loss studies, as I mentioned, are the most impressive. The problem is that you have to lose a fair amount of weight. Um, most people who enter a weight loss program um, might lose on average about 7% of their starting body weight. Um, and so uh, for if you weigh 200 uh, pounds and you lose 15 uh, pounds, uh, your blood pressure will come down significantly. Uh, and it may be as much as five or 10 or even 20 uh, millimeters of mercury. So when people lose even more weight than that, uh, from uh, from other pro other types of weight loss interventions that we'll discuss later in the course, uh, the amount of blood pressure reduction uh, can be quite uh, impressive. As I mentioned, limiting alcohol to less than a drink a day uh, can lower your blood pressure uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, more modestly. And reducing your salt intake uh, also can lower your blood pressure. This doesn't work in everyone, but it does work in older uh, folks particularly well, uh, where uh, as you get older, you lose some of the ability uh, to handle salt in the kidney. Uh, and so uh, older uh, uh, people uh, are, who are so, uh, maybe more sodium sensitive is a phrase we use. That is to say that if you restrict your salt intake, uh, the blood pressure may go down uh, more impressively. The DASH diet or the heart healthy diet uh, lowers uh, in the studies that were done, uh, lowered your blood pressure by six millimeters of mercury. And you can combine uh, the DASH diet with sodium restriction uh, and get uh, double uh, the benefit. And exercise um, also lowers your blood pressure. Uh, this is uh, consistent with the national exercise uh, recommendations of about 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week as a minimum. Uh, and that lowers your blood pressure uh, by uh, four to nine uh, points uh, from the, the big studies. I like to tell uh, uh, both practice and tell my patients that uh, physical exercise is biblical. Uh, I tell them that's a joke. And what I mean by that is six days a week of exercise and one day of rest. Uh, and that way, if you do the arithmetic and you exercise 30, 35 minutes a day, you can get up as a minimum uh, to that uh, 150 plus uh, um, minutes per week. A recent study uh, just uh, has shown, as, and some older studies, that twice that amount, even 300 minutes a week, is even more effective in preventing uh, uh, more early mortality, uh, as well as strokes and heart attacks. So physical activity turns out to be one of the uh, best things one can do when one thinks about one's life expectancy over the next many decades. I put here as a PS uh, that coffee, it turns out, I've already, I gave bath, I said something bad about coffee. Don't, take, don't drink coffee before you take your blood pressure or before you have anyone else take your blood pressure. But it turns out that habitual caffeine consumption is not associated with the risk of chronic high blood pressure. So coffee drinking is fine. Uh, the other things on the slide uh, are, are things to focus on, but coffee is still okay. Co coffee may have other side effects. It may upset your stomach, cause reflux, uh, make you jittery, anxious, cause atrial fibrillation, et cetera. Uh, but it is not associated with uh, the risk of hypertension, nor is it associated with the risk of a heart disease in the long term. So uh, we still recommend uh, coffee for those who want it or tea uh, as a fatigue mitigator uh, if you need that to get you going in the morning um, as long as you don't overdo it. All right, 
Uh, just a word or two about salt. Um, <clears throat> once upon a time, when I st first studied nutrition in my youth, um, I used to, I was taught and I used to repeat the principle that about a third of our salt in the, in the U.S. salt supply, on the food supply came naturally occurring from food. A third came at the table and the stove and a third came from uh, processed foods and restaurant foods. That is wrong. Uh, so that was true uh, many decades ago. It is not true currently. What is true currently is that the vast majority of salt in the US diet is comes from processed or prepared or restaurant uh, based foods. The amount of salt that you uh, get from takeout uh, or eating in restaurants uh, of almost any variety um, is substantially more than what most of us use uh, in our own food preparation. So even if you have a preference for saltier foods at home, it's unlikely you're coming near the dose that you would get from your favorite local restaurant. And so cooking and eating uh, do account for some salt, salt in the diet um, and naturally occurring still accounts for some of the food in the diet. But those two numbers, which used to be uh, the majority of uh, salt in our diet has been now overwhelmed uh, by the fact that we have moved our food supply uh, into foods that come in a bag or a box or a can or foods that come from the takeout driver uh, or uh, your local restaurant. So focusing on eating less of those uh, types of foods uh, is how you lower uh, salt in the diet. To, from my way of thinking, if you're eating some fresh tomatoes and they need a little bit of salt that uh, tastes better, by all means, or you're cooking your favorite dish and you need some sodium salt, uh, by all means. Uh, but focus, don't focus on the salt shaker at home as much, unless you're really heavy handed, uh, but focus on processed foods and pre-prepared foods. Now, one of, if you think about the way your local supermarket, at least the big chain type supermarkets are laid out, you know that most of the fresh food is around the circumference of the store and the, uh, and the middle aisles of the store uh, is where most things that are in a bag or a box or a can are placed. Now, I'm not saying never buy anything in a bag or a box or a can, but do so strategically. Because if you buy something in a bag or a box or a can, unless it says in big letters, low sodium or low in salt, you can be sure that it's pretty high in salt. And remember our goal is about two grams a day or two and a half grams a day of, of salt. Uh, and so you get up very quickly uh, from many of the foods uh, that we uh, typically consume. So that's a change in the way we teach about sodium restriction. We do recommend sodium restriction, again, particularly effective in older patients. Um, uh, and the way you do it is avoid foods in a bag or box or a can, uh, and uh, really be thoughtful about uh, uh, takeout food and, and restaurant food. This is a, a slide from food consumption data. Um, it's, uh, uh, it may not totally reflect our local uh, cuisines in, in San Francisco and the Bay Area, um, but it gives you an idea of the kind of, of foods from which most of the salt in the diet comes. Uh, and it turns out if I showed a list of the foods in which most of the excess calories in the American diet come, it's a almost exactly the same list. There's a slight change in, uh, in order and some of the elements, but mostly it's the same. And so things uh, that we mostly focus on are things with added, added sugars, like uh, desserts, uh, and things with processed flours, like breads. And you can see the other types of takeout foods, fast food in particular, uh, that make this list. So chicken fast food, pizza fast food, uh, soda pop and energy drinks, Cold cuts are famous uh, for salt. Uh, many of the condiments are high in salt, uh, salsas and salsas and Mexican mixed dishes. This is a fast food phenomenon. Any other cultures would, uh, would make the list in the Bay Area. This is a national database. 
uh, but this is like Taco Bell and that and fast foods uh, of that uh, sort. Uh, hot dogs and sausages and bacon, uh, you can imagine. Uh, cheese is relatively high in uh, salt, most cheeses and desserts are typically high in salt. So again, these, uh, these foods uh, where most of your salt comes from, it's not uh, the little bit of salt you put into your uh, stew or on your uh, salad. All right, let me move next uh, to medications uh, and begin this section of the talk by focusing on um, um, several studies that have tried to get at um, the three key questions that we should be thinking about as we decide how to treat high blood pressure. And those three questions are, does treatment at a specific blood pressure threshold, that is that 150 or that 140 or that 130, improve outcomes, that is reduce heart attack and stroke? And is there science to support that? Does a treatment to a specific goal improve outcomes, reduce heart attacks and strokes? And do different medications differ in their effectiveness to prevent heart attacks and strokes? So these are the kind of things we're thinking about and uh, as patients uh, and uh, as clinicians. Uh, that is, should I start, uh, should I call this patient high blood pressure? Should I start uh, treatment? Uh, should I use a medication? And if so, uh, to what goal? And what medication should I use? And when this study was done, this came out about five or so, a little five years or so ago. Uh, this was uh, one of the large uh, studies uh, funded periodically by the National Institutes of Health uh, on this topic. Uh, and it's, uh, the, it, it's a, a series of studies that has driven our uh, primary approach to hypertension for decades. There have been, this was the eighth version. They're done about every five years. So it's been about 40 or 50 years or so uh, that we've had this kind of approach to decision-making. Uh, and at each time it looks at the newest data and tries to put it all together. This time it was particularly carefully done because they only looked at what we call the randomized clinical trials. That is the big studies that gave a placebo uh, to uh, uh, half the patients ran at random and gave a medication uh, to the other half, uh, also chosen at random, followed them for a period of time, usually about five years or so, and measured the amounts of heart attacks and strokes. And I'll give you some examples of this in a moment. But the first recommendation it was the one that surprised people the most, um, which was, that based upon the dozens of studies that existed, um, admittedly, many of them older, that is that have been around for several or years or decades in some cases, that it turns out the evidence that starting uh, above 150 was strong and starting above 90 was strong, but that treating at levels lower than that had less evidence to support it. Now, when this came out, this was revolutionary because we were all using 140 as the magic uh, threshold, uh, also 90. Uh, but 140 over 90 has been our standard for quite some time. Uh, and this study began to uh, raise the issue, well, maybe the evidence isn't all that great between 140 and 150, and that we should, at least in older patients, let the patient, the blood pressure ride a little higher and accept patients between 140, accept blood pressures between 140 and 150 um, without uh, using medication. Uh, and again, uh, the goal was just to get it less than 150 in these studies. Um, and uh, this was not agreed to by everyone, even on the commission. So it was a strong recommendation from the uh, panel. Um, but it was not unanimous. Um, and you'll see in uh, several slides, the level of the lack of unanimity uh, is striking. Uh, that is to say, um, this is not a recommendation that is widely held. Um, and it's not routinely standard of practice. But it is worth noting that if you're very strict about demanding evidence uh, to support uh, 
what we do in clinical practice, that the evidence is not that strong that treating uh, at lower values in older patients prevents heart attacks and strokes. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it's worth noting uh, that for patients who prefer to be between 140 and 150 for other reasons, like the case we first discussed, who is 145 over 85, that might be an acceptable option. We'll come back to this uh, from different angles because there are many different opinions about this. The other recommendations were less controversial. Um, and mostly reinforced uh, what we uh, were our practice uh, at the time this was published, and to as many extent, to a, to much degree, our current practice as well. And what this said was that for patients less than age sixty or patients at uh, at higher risk, uh, you should use a lower threshold that is back to one forty over ninety uh, to start medication. Uh, so 150 in lower risk patients who are a bit older, uh, but 140 over 90 for people at higher risk uh, and younger patients. They also reviewed all the medications and came up with about the same list that we had been using from the earlier reports uh, by this panel over the years, uh, certainly a couple of iterations of this report. And basically, we have four uh, choices of medication, four classes of medications uh, that are shown here. Uh, and it turns out that they're all relatively uh, equivalent. Um, some of the older recommendations uh, were, had more uh, stronger opinions about thiazides as a preference. Hydrochlorothiazide is the most common thiazide, uh, but you may take diazide or chlorthalidone uh, as a thiazide type uh, uh, medication. Uh, and that's no longer the drug of first choice, but it's in the top three. The second category, which uh, wasn't always included, but ha has been for the last decade or so, are what we call calcium channel blockers. Um, you may take uh, aldosterone, I mean, uh, aldactone, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you, you may take uh, uh, diltiazem uh, or nifedipine or other calcium channel blockers. Um, these are excellent drugs. They can be used as the drug of first choice, uh, or uh, they can be used in combination with the other drugs on the list. Uh, so you can start with a calcium channel blocker, and we often do, and then we might add a thiazide as a second medication. Or we would add a third category, uh, which is equally as good as the other two, which are ACE inhibitors, so lisinopril or benazepril, um, again, there's uh, about a dozen of these. And these have uh, been around a long time. They're also extremely effective and they've been shown to prevent heart disease and strokes. And the fourth category are what we call angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, commonly called ARBs. And these are things like Losartan or Cozar uh, and, uh, and other medicines in that class. Uh, and the only, and so all four of these can be used. Uh, and uh, you can use thiazides and calcium channel blockers uh, together and with either of the ACE inhibitor or the R. The one proviso is not to use an ACE and an ARB together. Um, so it's uh, either thiazide, so it's really three classes of drugs of which two or an either or category. So that is either an ACE or an ARB, a calcium channel blocker or thiazide uh, type diuretic are the three uh, first choices for the vast majority of patients. There are other medicines that can also be used, but they're not of a, as effective as solo drugs, again, for our goal of preventing a stroke and heart disease. Um, However, if you have a, 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 a simultaneous other medical problem, say you have migraine headaches, and a beta blocker is particularly effective for preventing migraine headaches for you, or you have uh, 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 urinary tract symptoms and an alpha blocker is effective at preventing urinating at night, uh, then those are other types of uh, medicines, uh, less effective blood pressure medicines uh, but, uh, uh, but also medications that will lower your blood pressure uh, as well. 
But these are the three classes, the four ways to get to three, if you will, uh, of medicines that we rely on. Thiazides, calcium channel blockers, and either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And there's no preference anymore as to which to use first. And so uh, different uh, clinicians uh, have different preferences. Uh, different patients have different preferences. They have slightly different side effects, if any. Um, and depending on uh, conversations, we might pick, we would uh, pick one of these uh, three major categories. The one place where it's recommended based on scientific evidence to give preference to one of these classes over the others are in patients with chronic kidney disease or C CKD. In CKD, in chronic kidney disease, especially uh, moderate uh, levels of severity, uh, when, especially when there's protein in the urine, the ACEs and the ARBs, both, uh, to get, both either or, uh, both of them have been shown to prevent the progression of, your, uh, of renal failure. So both of these are recommended as a drug of first choice uh, for someone uh, with uh, kidney disease. For heart disease or strokes or other uh, reasons to treat blood pressure or just a high blood pressure, it doesn't matter. Again, any of the three are fine, but for CKD, we say either an ACE or an ARP, again, not together, too many side effects when used together, but either or, uh, uh, or an effective uh, first drug for high blood pressure. And many patients with high blood pressure need more than one drug. Um, in fact, many patients need three drugs. Uh, and so it's very common uh, for patients to take two or three medicines for high blood pressure. That's not unusual, it's not abnormal. Um, and these medicines work extremely well together. Once you get over three, if the blood pressure is still poorly controlled, that's a separate conversation. Uh, and there are a variety of medical conditions and, uh, and social, sociologic, social determinant type conditions, uh, which cause refractory high blood pressure um, and some hormor hormonal uh, uh, observations or abnorm abnormalities. And if you need a fourth drug, first the, doctor, the clinicians need to think, why is this happening? And the most common reason it's happening is because the patient uh, is not taking the medicine on a regular basis. So uh, imperfect adherence to the, the medicines is the most common reason why three drugs don't work. But there are many others and it requires a bit of an evaluation and assessment uh, and some thought as to what the best fourth drug would be. But we have a long list of at least a dozen, uh, certainly a good half dozen of uh, very commonly used medicines that work very well with these three uh, as medicines that can be used as a fourth drug if it's needed. But it shouldn't be started without a thought process as to why is this happening? Why does this patient need a fourth drug? Now, I'm, let's turn next to the SPRINT study as an example of one of the best done uh, studies in high blood pressure. Uh, this was very well done. It was funded by the National Institute of Health. There were about 10,000 uh, women and men um, that uh, were over age 50. Uh, and uh, almost 30% were over age 75. To enter the study, you needed a blood pressure, the top number, the systolic blood pressure of over 130. Interestingly though, to get into the study, you needed to have a high risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, that is of heart disease or stroke. We use uh, risk equations uh, to calculate one's cardiovascular risk. Oh, I'll go into detail about that uh, later in this course when we talk about cholesterol. Uh, but the equations are in common use now, and you can uh, find them uh, yourself. I'll show you how to do that when we get there. Um, but the patients who entered the study were at pretty high cardiovascular risk. It turned out that they had a 20% risk of having a cardiovascular event, that is a stroke or a heart attack in the next 10 years. So that's high, uh, and that's about the same risk as having a second heart attack if you've had a first. So that's high risk, and uh, I'll come back to that because it makes the generalizability of this study questionable when you apply it to people who were not at such high risk. Interestingly, in this study, they excluded people with diabetes, and that was a little bit weird, but the reason they had done, did that was because there had just been another study with the same design, that is comparing uh, 
treating at uh, beginning at 120 versus treating at 140. Um, and in patients with diabetes, and it turned out that there was no benefit. In the diabetes study, one, there was no extra benefit by treating to less than 120 than there was to treating to less than 140. And that's why our recommendations, even for diabetes, was uh, to treat to 140 until this SPRINT study came out. So this is a little bit confusing because we have another study that contradicts what I'm going to about to show you, um, but also uh, makes the generalizability of this study a little bit uh, uncertain, uh, doesn't make it right or wrong, but uncertain uh, about patients with diabetes. The basic principle of the study, uh, the basic experimental uh, research question was, uh, if we treated people uh, to under 120, did they do better than if we treated people to 140? Well, one observation, there are a couple observations, was that no, number one is that to get to less than 120 takes at least one extra medication. So on average, the patients in the 120 group needed almost three medicines to get there, and the patients in the 140 group only needed two. So more medication uh, to get to less than 120. In addition, what's interesting is that the, the even though the, the design was to get these people under 120, the actual blood pressure was 121. That was the average. So that means about half the patients did not get under 120. So what that implies is that it's hard to get people under 120. And I'll show you the, the side effects that interfere with getting to under 120 uh, in just a moment. But nonetheless, there was a difference in the two arms, 121 versus 136. And it allowed the investigators to really try to answer the question, which is, was tighter control, if you will, more effective than a looser approach? Is 120 better than 140? And the answer in this study was yes. So I already showed you the results of all the prior studies put together where the answer was no. But in this study, very well done, uh, uh, federally funded, uh, it was, uh, a, there was a 25% reduction uh, in cardiovascular events in the people who were in the tight control group. Now it's worth noting that the event rate is pretty rare. So in this five-year study, not that many patients had heart attacks or strokes. Uh, remember, I told you that the prediction would be that they would have 20% in 10 years or 2% per year, and that's what they found. Uh, and the reduction was to 1.5% per year. So statistically, it's significant. Uh, for an individual person, you have, one would have to decide, is that amount of a difference of risk uh, worth uh, the extra medication. And strikingly, and I think uh, most uh, importantly about this study, that not only did it prevent heart attacks and strokes, but it also saved lives. So there was a reduction in the death rate, but again, by a quarter, um, uh, reducing the uh, death rate per year from 1.4 to 1.0. So again, statistically significant event, uh, the absolute amount uh, uh, is small, but again, a life is a life. Um, and um, this shows that if you can do it in the right patients, uh, getting down to less than 120 uh, can prevent heart attacks and strokes and save lives. Now, this came at a bit of a cost. Uh, and the investigators were looking for side effects. And so they predefined certain side effects that they were most worried about. And, low, and these were all side effects that were serious enough uh, for the patient, uh, uh, for example, to go to the emergency department. So uh, there was an increased rate by 67% of uh, low blood pressure requiring a visit to the uh, emergency department. Uh, there was a one third increase in uh, passing out requiring a visit to the uh, emergency department. Uh, there were a third of patients had more problems with their blood chemistries, um, usually potassium abnormalities, either too low or too high. Uh, and initially uh, there was um, some change in kidney function, uh, although the, uh, the long-term effect on the kidney was actually positive. 
and I'll review that at the end. Uh, but there was some damage, uh, short-term temporary damage uh, during the study, but this did not, this is not uh, important in the long term. But it does illustrate that taking three medicines and to a blood pressure of less than 120 has some side effects in some people um, uh, diff as compared to two medicines and 140. In medicine, uh, one way, if you remember that first slide of the seesaw where we're balancing risks versus uh, benefit, uh, one way to think about that is how many patients does one need to treat in order to get the benefit that we are thinking about? So in this particular case, um, uh, for the primary aggregate outcome, which meant a combination of heart attack strokes uh, and, and death and so on, uh, we had to treat 60 patients to prevent one outcome. Um, and to save a life, uh, we had to treat uh, close to 100 patients. So if you're that one patient, then this was really important. If you're the other 90 patients, then you didn't benefit. And that's the kind of trade-off that we have to think about when we uh, define risk with individual patients. Uh, and how risk averse are you? Uh, in other words, willing to do more to prevent a risk of a heart attack or stroke versus preferring to do less because you don't want side effects or the, you figure the odds are still on your side. And this is the kind of conversation we have in almost every test in medicine. Uh, certainly was active during the COVID of, of pandemic with medications and vaccines. And we'll talk about that later in the course. The side effects had relatively similar uh, uh, numbers needed, and then H stands for number needed to harm. So this is the number needed to benefit, and this is the number needed to harm. And again, roughly equal uh, amounts, but keep in mind the number, the benefits are much greater uh, than the harms. Uh, but it does show that a, a, a fair amount of patients uh, also develop side effects, uh, as we discussed. So how do we interpret all this uh, data? Um, and I'll show you what the community has done uh, in recent years as a result of this data. But the study showed in a very well done fashion that treating to a blood pressure of under 120 had better cardiovascular disease and mortality benefit than a, a systolic blood pressure of under 140. But it took uh, 60, you had to treat 61 patients over three years or 180 patients per year in order to get that one person who benefited. And notably, there were uh, adverse effects requiring emergency room uh, visits uh, that were also uh, about the same order of magnitude, but not as serious as these benefits, but nonetheless important. In conclusion, I think the con one of the controversies is that these were very high risk patients. Uh, that is their risk of having a heart attack or stroke was very high. Uh, and in fact, they did have heart attacks uh, at the risk of 2% per year, as we would have predicted. Uh, but this is a, uh, the, the risk of this high, that 20% threshold only applies to about one out of six patients uh, with high blood pressure. So if you're a patient with high blood pressure whose risk of having a heart attack or stroke is lower, then I would argue this study applies to you less and maybe not at all. But certainly if you're a patient at high risk and certainly if you're a patient that's already had a stroke or had a TIA or had a, a, heart, a heart attack or heart failure uh, or kidney disease, uh, then this does apply to you. And that'll be the conclusion that we circle back to in a minute. There are other uh, features of this study. It doesn't really tell us much about diabetes. Uh, they excluded some uh, people that were uh, all the frail. They excluded people who were young. And as I mentioned, uh, these, these are individuals who are high risk of having cardiovascular disease. And I'll show you how to calculate that later in the course. And like many studies, they were, these were, this was free care, frequent visits, uh, research grade blood pressure measurement uh, and uh, very careful uh, monitoring and adherence of taking the medicine. One final point, uh, remember that the blood pressure 
based on this research grade measurement, and this study was over uh, almost it was 12 points lower than it was in the regular office. Uh, and so that may also be an important thing to keep in mind uh, if you're deciding to use uh, these values in your decision making. As a result of this study, uh, the, our expert uh, panels uh, coming from the, uh, the cardiology uh, field, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, uh, took this study and sort of uh, to upset the cart right away uh, and changed some definitions. Uh, so they define a normal blood pressure as less than 120. Uh, and for the first time, they define an elevated blood pressure as anything between 120 and 130. Uh, this is, was new uh, as a result of this study. And similarly, this was new. That is that hypertension was now defined as anything over 130. Uh, this was new, uh, and it uh, has some major uh, public health implications if we uh, adhere to this, because uh, it, it makes about half the people in the United States having high definition of hypertension. Uh, currently, it's about a third, uh, and with this moving from uh, this definition of 130 as the threshold rather than 140, takes it from one third of the population to one half. Uh, so that's an important uh, public health uh, consideration. Um, and their thresholds for treatment were aligned with uh, the definitions uh, for secondary prevention. And by that, we mean people who have already had a stroke or a heart attack. The recommendations are uh, to use 130 as the threshold uh, and the goal to be less than 130 and less than 80. In people at high cardiovascular risk, they might say 10% uh, in 10 years or 1% per year. Uh, they would also use 130 as a threshold and less than 130 and less than 80 as the goal. And for people who with lower risk, they would use 140 and 90. So a little bit different than what we saw from the big federal study, uh, initial uh, uh, Joint National Commission study, uh, and this really upset uh, the cart. Um, and um, changed uh, practice in the United States considerably. Now, this created a fair amount of controversy and it's why I'm talking on this subject because there is still controversy. That is to say the internal medicine community and the family medicine community, the two professions that in addition to pediatrics make up primary care, or in this case, adult primary care, um, said, you know, we've looked at this data and we don't think it applies uh, to all of uh, the population, nor does uh, it reflect all of the other studies that were done before this newer study was done. Uh, and in fact, uh, they came out and said, uh, we, we hear you uh, to the cardiologist. Uh, we hear what you're saying. We see this very nice study in high-risk patients. Uh, but we still think the literature uh, strongly suggests what I said earlier. That is that for patients over age 60, uh, we could use 150 as a threshold. Uh, for people over 60 who are at higher risk, we should use 140. Uh, and for younger patients, we should use 140. So we now have two groups of really smart people who have thought a lot about this coming up with different recommendations. And this is still where it stands. They also said uh, that, um, uh, that they were not gonna endorse the Heart Association guidelines. Uh, they thought that the Joint National Commission report upheld scientific rigor, uh, uh, but that the uh, cardiology uh, reviews um, did not put together all the prior studies, but rather was just uh, relying on this one new study. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you use the values from the SPRINT study, it means half the population has hypertension as opposed to a third. And so the primary care community said, uh, not yet. Now, since these studies came out, there have been a few other studies. Um, and this uh, now looking at what we call meta-analyses is putting all these studies together and see what they uh, all show together. Um, and um, 
and here's here's an, uh, a well done one that looked at all the world's literature uh, and tried to answer the same question that we've been getting at, which is what is our threshold? And what they showed was, uh, as the earlier studies showed, that if you started with a blood pressure that was higher than 160 and you treated it to less than 150 at least, that you saved uh, lives and you prevented heart attacks and strokes. Uh, and these numbers with the asterisk are statistically significant. So this is uh, shows that treating high blood pressure works. We know that. Interestingly, they showed if you start at 140 as your threshold, uh, rather than 160, it still works. And that uh, if, if you treat people who are 140 or 145 or 150 or 155, you also prevent heart attacks and strokes and save lives. And again, statistically significant. Interestingly, in this very large meta-analysis of the world's literature, they found that in patients whose blood pressure was less than 140, did not, there was no benefit of treating the blood pressure, uh, no impact on uh, events and no impact on the death rate. Um, so this is different than the SPRINT study, uh, but now again has an opposing uh, point of view, looking at uh, all of the studies uh, done uh, in, the, in the literature. Now they did find, make one observation, which is they did find a subset of patients um, if you had a heart attack in the, in the past and your blood pressure was less than 140, at least by a little, it did prevent events. It didn't save lives, uh, but it, there was a reduction in, in a recurrent heart attack or stroke. And so this is encouraging because this is a, at least gives us a little bit of overlap uh, with SPRINT. That is in patients at very high risk of heart disease or stroke that uh, being more aggressive with treatment uh, is effective. Now, in the last few years, a variety of other groups of experts, so I've given you the uh, American Heart Association uh, uh, cardiology experts and the uh, internal medicine and family medicine groups of experts and their uh, professional opinions. Uh, but a variety of other groups have also looked at all this and uh, come up, again, come up with different recommendations. Um, at first, uh, it was um, interesting that the European Society of Cardiology and the European Society of High Blood Pressure uh, said that, you know, let's look at all the literature together and we'll stick with 140. The uh, British system uh, that has its own National Institute for Health uh, called a NICE, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, they reviewed the literature and for their national health policy, they said, we're going to stick with 140 as well. And the International Society of Hypertension, another specialty organization, also reviewed the literature and said 140. The nephrologists reviewed the literature and they agreed with the cardiologists. And so they also used uh, a lower threshold for them. So we have the nephrologists, the kidney specialists, and the heart and the cardiologists in one camp, the family medicine, internal medicine, and some of these international groups uh, in another camp. So in summary, what do we do for this 68-year-old uh, patient? Um, her, uh, in this case, I said woman, uh, her blood pressure was 145 over 85. Um, there was no, again, no history of diabetes, heart disease, or stroke. And as you've seen, we have two different opinions in the community. And since she's at low risk of having a heart disease or stroke um, uh, because she has no other risk factors, uh, you could either do what the uh, Joint National Commission does and use let her be alone at 145 over 85 because you're using 150 as the threshold, or you could say, well, it should be less than 140, uh, our older recommendation, because she is uh, uh, a, a little bit, of, she is at risk of events simply based on age. So the yellow here are the correct answers, in my opinion. Uh, for this particular uh, patient uh, in this uh, model uh, question, that if this patient uh, is 145 or 85, you can do either. And it really becomes up to the patient and the clinician to really think this through. This would be an excellent uh, situation to make sure one is checking the blood pressure correctly. Uh, one might do home monitoring to make sure that number in the office is correct. 
uh, repeat the measurement in the office to make sure it was done correctly. Um, one might even consider an ambulatory blood pressure monitor to see what it looks like uh, over the course of a 24 hour period. Uh, but if the patient says, you know, I'd rather not take any medication, this might be a blood pressure that you can accept. On the other hand, if she says, no, I'm really afraid of a stroke or a heart attack, I'm willing to take my uh, a medication, uh, then it would be perfectly correct to first try if, you, if she's motivated a non-drug treatment with the, uh, the efforts we discussed um, uh, or start a medication uh, with uh, one of the three classes of medicines, again, that we, or four classes uh, that we discussed. So in summary, um, uh, rethink the way blood pressure is measured. Uh, <clears throat> if you get a high blood pressure measurement, uh, it's always okay to ask for a repeat measurement. <clears throat> uh, use home blood pressure monitoring, uh, but do so with greater rigor. Uh, consider ambulatory blood pressure monitoring before making uh, major treatment decisions. Uh, for most patients, we still use 140, less than 140 and less than 90 as our threshold. Uh, but there is some evidence that for some older patients whose preference is uh, to use one less medicine, uh, that we can allow 140 to 150 uh, for some lower risk older patients. And uh, conversely, uh, the evidence would suggest, based on the SPRINT study and the meta-analysis I showed you, that for some high-risk patients, especially people who've already had a stroke or a heart attack, it is very important to treat it more assertively uh, and get the benefit that we saw from SPRINT. Uh, and again, using 130 and 80 as the threshold there. And again, that's people with heart disease, stroke, or kidney disease, uh, or whose calculated risk of having an event in the next year is very high. So uh, again, uh, there's still a lot of controversy in this area. There's a lot of room for uh, uh, personal values uh, and a lot of room for discussion with one's clinician uh, and making a very thoughtful uh, decision uh, about this subject. So you share decision-making. Uh, increasingly, we're using working uh, with uh, teams of health professionals to manage high blood pressure, uh, not only uh, primary clinicians, but also pharmacists uh, and, and uh, nurses and uh, uh, community advocates. Um, and remember, although we didn't uh, spend a lot of time discussing it, all those things that we talked about that work uh, to treat high blood pressure without medication also work uh, to prevent high blood pressure in the first place. And that should be an a increasing uh, emphasis of our, uh, of our work. So with that, I will uh, stop sharing. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, excuse me, and um, see if there are any uh, questions. Uh, uh, so can a patient buy ambulatory, uh, uh, buy ambulatory blood pressure monitor? Uh, the most accurate ones are the kind you get on a prescription. Uh, this is covered uh, by most, um, most insurances, uh, but not all, so ask. Um, and Medicare will cover it, but only if uh, the doctor uh, says that it's for an elevated blood pressure. If the doctor writes in it's for high blood pressure, for hypertension, it won't be covered. So in other words, Medicare will accept it as a tiebreaker but not uh, to use it as uh, a way to monitor uh, blood pressure treatment. Uh, but uh, it is a prescription and that's the way to go. Now, there are many other uh, devices being developed. Um, most of them have not been adequately studied. Uh, I've, as I've discussed, even these really durable, uh, long-standing uh, methods of high blood pressure uh, have not been uh, measurement, have not been uh, extraordinarily well studied. So there's still controversy. Uh, but in this particular case, the uh, best way is to uh, get it on a prescription. Uh, and mo in most cases, it'll be covered by insurance. It's not in a super expensive test. Um, it's um, moderately priced. Um, if you're measuring blood pressure uh, twice a day at home, uh, every day for medication adjustment and averaging all the measurements, uh, what percent of the measurements over the acceptable hive limit are acceptable? For example, if your total average over about 200 measurements is 122 over 74, how many measurements over 130 over 80 would be acceptable? The answer is some. 
uh, you know, blood pressure varies over the course of the day. And that's the point of taking it both in the morning and at night or in the evening uh, before dinner, because uh, you get that uh, variability of time of day. Um, and so, uh, and if we were graphing this uh, with a, a, a pencil and paper, uh, the, the average is say the line that you would draw on a, on a graph uh, correlating your blood pressure, uh, but the dots, the data points would be on both sides of the line and that's normal. Uh, and so you can tolerate, um, um, what, if your goal is 130, you can tolerate a number of measurements over 130 as long as the average is uh, in, in well in the treatable range as, as your example suggests. Now, if it was over 160 some of the time or over 180 some of the time, uh, that's not okay. Uh, and that would require more conversation. Um, again, the most common cause of that kind of variation is when people forget to take their medications um, uh, uh, or other factors uh, that we talked about that cause a second, what we call secondary hypertension or interfere with uh, blood, pre uh, blood pressure control. And that requires its own uh, assessment um, yeah. and sometimes treatment. Uh, but in general, the, 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 the variations within the normal range or within this uh, range of normal that we're discussing uh, are quite acceptable and, and in fact, predictable. Uh, and so that should be not uh, abnormal at all. When you see the chart from a 24 hour monitor, uh, <clears throat> it'll, it'll have all those wiggles as the blood pressure varies over the course of the day. While you're exercising, your blood pressure goes up. Uh, while you're at the grocery store, your blood pressure's up. Uh, while you're talking to your kids, your blood pressure may be up. While you're at work, your blood pressure may be up. So there are a variety of life circumstances in which your blood pressure increases a bit. Um, and that's why the average uh, is what's most important. For those with mathematically minded, it's what we call the area under the curve, if you will. Uh, but the average is a good way to think of it. When, meds, when, you, when you say meds are recommended for a systolic blood pressure over 150 or 140, is this an average uh, or of many measurements? Uh, and so this is a similar question, yet the answer is yes, we work with averages. Um, and it's not, again, there's normal variation of the blood pressure throughout uh, the human day, uh, and that's normal. The question is, what is the average over the course of the day? Uh, and again, we get at that with our two measurements in a given day. Um, that's a four person's way to get at it uh, and a more sophisticated way to get at it again is the 24 hour ambulatory monitor. And so yes, home blood pressure measurements tend to be five points lower, both on the top number and the lower number. And similarly, the 24 hour measurements are also, so if you're using 140 over 90, you might use 135 over 85 as thresholds at home. Is the tendency to get high blood pressure heritable? Uh, uh, if you had an elderly uh, parent with high blood pressure, uh, should we take steps to modify our risk factors at an earlier age? Yes and yes. Uh, so uh, there is a, a familial pattern to high blood pressure. Um, so high blood pressure is, uh, we, you know, we call it essential hypertension or primary hypertension, meaning we don't always know what's the causes, uh, but it does run in families. Uh, and for secondary hypertension, where there is a specific uh, cause, say an uh, adrenal tumor, or those are definitely uh, familial. Um, but for run-of-the-mill, regular old hypertension, yes, uh, if your parents both had hypertension, you are at greater risk of it, uh, in the same way that if your patients had premature heart disease or stroke, you're at greater risk for it. Uh, and same, uh, you may remember the old cholesterol ads when the medications first came out, uh, is it your grandmother or is it your diet? Um, and the answer is, as we'll talk about uh, in the context of cholesterol, you, your grandmother played a very important role. Uh, so these are familial issues, but they can be modified with diet and lifestyle, and they certainly can be modified very effectively uh, with careful use of medications. So with that, I wish you uh, good night and uh, all the best. Mm -hmm.